Welcome everyone to the first session of the day on Byzantine Attacks and Consensus. Our first talk will be on genuinely distributed Byzantine machine learning by El Madi El Mamdi, Hachid Gehawi, Astani Gigis, Le Guen Huang, who will be giving the talk, and Sebastian Huo. Please go ahead, Le. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, to begin, I'm just going to uh, introduce a bit of the basic ideas of, of machine learning. So I think we can see machine learning as an algorithm design approach, where instead of writing the algorithms, we're going to train it. Uh, namely, we have a model with a lot of parameters and we're going to adjust the model, the, the parameters to fit some data. So typically, given a current state of the machine, uh, we're going to ask the machine to make a prediction based on some data. So for instance, a picture of a cat or, or, or not a cat. And depending on what uh, the algorithms are, are output, uh, we're going to then uh, tweak the parameters. So we're going to have compute a so-called gradient that's going to tell us how to turn the different knobs of a machine. And uh, essentially, that's basically it. Uh, we're going to uh, be having this machine with a lot of parameters. And uh, depending on the current state of the machine and on the data, we're always going to update it based on these gradients. Uh, now, machine learning uh, has uh, achieved uh, quite uh, amazing uh, progress over the last few years. And this uh, is mostly based on uh, large amounts of, of data. And so these days, uh, the data, uh, the training sets are usually extremely big. In fact, they are sometimes uh, often too big to be uh, uh, so that they can be stored uh, in a single machine. Uh, and in, in this case, uh, many researchers have moved towards uh, a distributed versions of, of, of this uh, algorithm design approach by having a server that contains all of the parameters, but by distributing the data over different workers uh, and having the servers. So the server would send like the models, the parameters of the model to the different workers. Workers would use this and their local data to compute the gradients. Then they would send the gradient to the server and this greatly accelerates the machine learning training. Uh, now the trouble when you're decentralizing anything, of course, is uh, the problem of, uh, of uh, faults. In particular, uh, in this paper and many papers, uh, what is considered is uh, Byzantine faults, which really makes sense in the context of, uh, of machine learning because in order to sort of uh, hack a, 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 a worker, you don't need to hack the worker itself, you can just hack the data of the worker. And this is, can be very critical for critical applications. Uh, you can think, for instance, uh, of medical applications or uh, social uh, media recommender systems, for instance, uh, that affect a lot of, of people. Uh, now, this particular problem uh, has been widely studied. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a research uh, the direction that has been initiated by our research group. And over the last uh, four years, there have been a lot of publications uh, that communicated in the, the PhD thesis of uh, Nadia Hamdi, one of the co authors of this work. Uh, however, this framework uh, is not genuinely distributed in the sense that you still have this single point of failure, namely on the server side. Uh, and so what we did in this work is to uh, study uh, the case where you try to genuinely distribute uh, machine learning by uh, also distributing uh, the, the server side. In particular, we try to design uh, algorithms that were uh, Byzantine fault tolerant uh, for any components of the system. Uh, now, of course, there, there would be one uh, way to, to, to attack this problem using the classical toolbox of distributed computing, uh, like, for instance, state machine replication. But this would be extremely costly uh, in the context of machine learning where you have these big models. But also, uh, it wouldn't work for an asynchronous uh, network, which is what we consider in this work. And so instead, we designed a tailored solution for, for, this, uh, for this system that in particular take care of this problem of modal drift that occurs when different servers are uh, receiving uh, gradients from different uh, workers or, or by workers that are Byzantines that tell uh, different gradients to different servers. And the main theorem of our work is that the algorithm we designed, which we call uh, BizSGD, guarantees asynchronous, uh, genuinely distributed Byzantine machine learning. In fact, in the synchronous case, we've even found a way to uh, speed up uh, the computation to gain uh, over 50% in terms of performance. So in our work, we have both new algorithms and new theorems, but perhaps the most uh, interesting contribution of our work is to initiate this new line of research of genuinely distributed machine learning. And in fact, uh, in the months that followed uh, our, our submissions at, at, at POTSI, we've uh, realized that if you consider the more general case where you have non-IID uh, distributions of the data uh, on the local uh, workers, 
uh, we found out that there was a really neat uh, reduction from this genuinely distributed machine learning problem to a more classical agreement problem. Uh, and the paper about this has, uh, is now on archive. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Lee, for the presentation. Do we have any questions to Lee, uh, either on uh, Zoom or Zulip? Okay, here we have one in uh, Zulip. Can you give an example of really problematic model drift? So, so, the, so, so typically the problem of model drift is, is likely to occur just because of asynchrony, like people get different uh, data from different server. And if you consistently have this drift between different models and the parameters become too different so that the gradient that's computed for one server would be completely invalid for the other server. And this can then uh, completely uh, uh, it inhibits the, the learning of, of the, the system. At least you're not going to learn a single model and you're going to need a different uh, gradients for different uh, servers, which is, which is going to be very uh, suboptimal. Do we have any more questions? Uh, we have one here on Zoom chat. I'm going to copy that to Zulu. And it is uh, about your problem motivation versus data poisoning attacks by Lily Su. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, so, so this framework really applies to, to poisoning attacks uh, as well. Uh, so the poisoning would come from the, the worker side where the, the, the data is. Um, and uh, uh, we, well, we have uh, proofs that uh, uh, essentially you're not going to be too uh, hurt by these and you can guarantee uh, that the gradient of, of, of the loss function will, will, will be uh, going down. We have another question by Nidupam. Uh, do you assume complete asynchrony or partial asynchrony? So we you assume a uh, full asynchrony. And another question from Jane. Uh, how does this relate to other Byzantine SGD papers and proposed approaches? Yeah, so, so the, the, the methods are, are quite similar, uh, but here there are like new algorithms for the, the server side. In, in particular, like the difficulty was to avoid this model drift and to, to guarantee that uh, like we, we can get the parameters of the, all the servers to, to, to approximately agree. Uh, there's another question by Lily. Uh, how much is your local data set size versus total data size? Uh, so I, I don't re remember exactly uh, the, the, the simulation parts of, of the paper, uh, but uh, I, I think th this is more like, uh, like on the theoretical side, uh, there, there is no limit. Do we have any further questions before we proceed? Doesn't seem like it. So thanks, Le, for the very interesting talk and everyone for your questions, and we will proceed now. Just a minute, I'm going to be giving Nirupam the co-host um, privileges. Mm. Please go ahead and uh, share your screen. Great. So thanks. So our next talk is by Nirupam Gupta in a joint paper with Nitin Vaidya, both from Georgetown University. And the talk title is Fault Tolerance and Distributed Optimization. The case of redundancy. Please go ahead, Nirupam. Hi, uh, can you guys see my screen here? Yes. Is there any yes. obstruction or anything? It's and great. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So let's start. Hello, everyone. I am Nirupam. I will talk about my joint work with Professor Nitin on fault tolerance in distributed optimization. Now, <clears throat> From what I've heard and read, this problem of distributed multi-agent optimization started to gain a lot of attention in 1980s. And John Sicklis did some very nice work, some very prominent work in this field in his PhD dissertation 
that was published in 1984. So in this problem, you have multiple agents. Each agent has a cost function represented by Q, which depends on a global variable W. And the objectives of the agents is to communicate with each other to collectively compute a point such as W star that minimizes the aggregate of all the cost functions. Now this uh, abstract theoretical problem has many practical applications. For example, consider the case of multi-agent rendezvous problem where the cost is uh, the physical or the transportation cost for the agent to move to a location W from its current location and W star is the meeting point. In distributed machine learning problem is naturally a distributed optimization problem as uh, you just saw in the talk presented earlier. And a multi-agent classification problem can also be classified model as a distributed optimization problem where the cost is basically the error for making an hypothesis W by agent I. W star in this particular case is the true identity of the object being observed. Now, all these prior works consider a utopian setting where the agents are honest and they follow the prescribed protocol honestly. However, in practice, that may not be the case as, uh, just, as you just saw in the previous talk. Some of the agents may not follow the prescribed algorithm honestly and may send malicious information, may even have malicious cost functions. In, in context of learning, they have malicious data points. So we, per, uh, in particular, consider a case here where up to F of the agents are Byzantine faulty. Now, in presence of these Byzantine faulty agents, it's sort of unreasonable to still compute a point such as W star that minimizes the aggregate of all the, init, all the agents cost functions. So a more reasonable goal is to compute a point such as W star H that would minimize the aggregate of only the honest cost functions. Now, this problem was introduced formally in 2016 by Lily and Nathan in their paper, uh, in their proxy paper, where they proposed an algorithm that minimize the weighted aggregate of the honest cost functions. These weights may be uh, non-uniform and therefore we say like, so their objective was to approximately uh, compute the solution. So let's just call it approximate fault tolerance. What we are considering here is the exact fault tolerance where the weights are uniform. However, they did show uh, in their paper that exact fault tolerance, that is these weights cannot be uniform unless you have some sort of correlation between the cost functions or there's some redundancy in the cost functions. Uh, what that redundancy was, was not characterized formally at the time. Since then, as you just saw in the previous talk, there has been a lot of work in distributed machine learning community. Uh, I would like to point out this work by Blanchard and colleagues, including Rashid Al Mahdi from EPFL, where they proposed an exact fault tolerance algorithm uh, for distributed machine, for distributed homogeneous machine learning problem where the agent's costs were assumed to be identical in expectation. Since then, there's been a significant work in machine learning community on exact fault tolerance with assuming different perspectives and models and slightly varying the problem objectives. However, in all these works so far, until now, the precise characterization of redundancy was unknown for exact fault tolerance. So, uh, so we started to work on this uh, particular problem, and we found out that exact fault tolerance cannot be achieved unless and cannot be achieved if 2F redundancy property is violated. What 2F redundancy means is that a point that minimizes the cost functions of any n minus 2F honest agents also minimizes the aggregate of all the honest agents' cost functions, and vice versa. If this condition does not satisfy, you cannot problem, solve the problem exactly. Now, at this point, it may seem a very contrived, theoretically contrived condition, like when can this even happen? However, in practice, we see there are a lot of systems where redundancy, uh, 2F redundancy or some sort of redundancy holds naturally. For example, in homogeneous distributed learning where all the agents are randomly sampling data points from a common uh, distribution of data, 2F redundancy holds naturally. In case of classification problem, it boils down to having a redundant sensor observations, for example, you can identify an elephant using these four at the back or these four at the front. You may not need all the sensors in the systems. Now, what uh, we have sh also shown is that 2F redundancy is sufficient in the server agent architecture where let's say the agent is able to, sub agent is able to supply the entire information of their cost functions to the server. However, in practice, you may never be able to supply entire or complete information about your cost functions to the server more often than not, agents are only able to supply uh, gradients of their cost functions at finite points. So we pick up 
a standard distributed uh, optimization algorithm, which is a uh, distributed gradient descent method and try to make it resilient to Byzantine faulty agents. So in this method, the server maintains an estimate of W star, let's call it WT for iteration T. It broadcasts this WT to the agents, the agents compute the gradients of their cost functions at WT, supply the gradients back to the server, the server aggregates the gradients and updates its local uh, parameter, a local estimate in, in, in the manner as shown here. Now in presence of faulty agents, of course, the faulty agents will send you faulty gradients and it may just send any arbitrary vector for its gradient. So how do you take care of this? The idea is very simple. You just filter the received gradients. And the idea goes back to the original paper by Lily and Nathan, where they proposed a scalar trim mean based uh, gradient filter for scalar gradients. And uh, you, could, you can also extend it to high dimensional gradients under certain conditions. We here consider the general cost functions and a general setting and were not able to nicely extend the scalar, uh, the scalar filters to high dimensional gradients. So we propose a, norm, a Euclidean norm-based gradient filter, which we call comparative gradient clipping or CGC for short. I don't have time to go into the details of this filter. Let me go to the technical guarantees that we were able to achieve in our paper. So we showed that gradient descent, distributed gradient descent method with our proposed CGC gradient filter can guarantee exact fault tolerance if 2F redundancy holds, which in any case is necessary to solve the problem. Cost gradients are Lipschitz continuous. What uh, in standard uh, practical systems, this uh, assumption is often uh, satisfied in only in very rare cases, you may see that this condition is getting violated. Uh, one drawback of our scheme here is that we want the aggregate cost functions to be strongly convex. In practice, you may not have this condition satisfied all the time. However, there are techniques to extend algorithms that are just given for convex cost functions to strongly convex cost functions. Another shortcoming of our CGC gradient filter is that we require the fraction of faults to be bounded in addition to 2F redundancy. Now, this may indicate some non-optimal uh, fault tolerance performance. However, at this point, I would like to note, we do not know if there could exist a gradient filter that would achieve exact fault tolerance with only 2F redundancy assumption. And one reason for that is because the gradient descent method is an iterative greedy algorithm. And uh, you, what we have seen from our work on fault tolerance is greedy approaches need not be optimal for exact fault tolerance in, uh, in systems, if, uh, as specifically for distributed optimization. So, so that's still an open problem. Can you propose a gradient filter that will achieve optimal uh, exact fault tolerance without assuming anything else but 2 f redundancy? Now, uh, so far we have only considered server agent architecture and a complete peer-to-peer -peer network. And we are looking to extend the firm to incomplete peer-to-peer -peer networks, which as in the talk earlier you see, uh, you have seen that is more uh, pragmatic and prevalent in practical systems. Now, some extensions that are worth noting is that the system, uh, our CGC gradient filter can be extended to partially asynchronous system or partially synchronous system, meaning the agents have uh, the parties involved in the computation have some sense of time and can be easily extended to stochastic gradient descent method, uh, which is more prevalent in distributed machine learning applications where agents cannot compute exact true gradient of their cost functions, but they can compute some noisy estimators of their stochastic of their cost functions. Lastly, you can also relax the redundancy assumption, which would uh, let us extend our algorithm for heterogeneous learning where the data points being observed by agents are different. Their probability distributions are different and not exactly the same, unlike the homogeneous distributed learning problem. Now, the details of our work, you can uh, watch the YouTube video. You can look, look into these archive reports on which our paper was uh, was based upon that was submitted to POTC and some other related work you can also find on archive. And I would like to thank our sponsors like Army Research Lab, National Science Foundation. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk. If there are any questions, I would be happy to take. Thank you very much. Thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, we have some questions already. First one from Lily Sue. In homogeneous setting, the 2F redundancy holds in expectation only. That is only when each agent has infinitely many data points. Good agents cost functions are identical. Do you have a comment on that? I guess that is more of a comment. Yeah, so in case of learning, our cost functions are the expected cost functions. 
so it's not expectation of cost functions. We just consider the cost functions to be the expected loss functions itself. So, so that's why what I meant is like in this deterministic setting, if you just consider the cost function to be the expected loss function, then if you are using gradient descent method, then uh, this just theoretically in principle to efficiency just holds mm -hmm. trivially. However, uh, the, I think what she meant to say is like we can uh, extend 2 f redundancy to stochastic uh, settings as well, where you do, need not have 2 f redundancy in deterministic sense, but in uh, some probabilistic sense. Like, okay, 2 f redundancy holds with some high probability or something like that. And we have another question by Guy Gohan. Uh, how is your analysis affected by the usage of momentum in addition to the SGD? Well, uh, so, so far our objective has been on exact fault tolerance. We are not looking in increasing the convergence rate of the algorithm. If, uh, but there is a good point that uh, the presence of faulty agents does affect the convergence rate, let's say in context of if we are building it on top of stochastic gradient descent. So it might be useful to use some accelerated gradient descent method uh, because accelerated methods reduce the variance of the stochastic gradients. So reducing the variance does help in achieving better fault tolerance. But uh, we have something on it, like we are currently working something on it, but uh, we, I don't have anything uh, that uh, you can read right now on, online or something. Thanks for the talk and for addressing the questions. Uh, now we're, we're, we'll proceed right, to the Thank you very much. Thanks, and we will proceed to the next a uh, talk by Nitsan Zamir. That's a uh, joint work with Johan Moses. And the title of the talk is um, Probably Approximately Knowing. Nitsan, could you please uh, share a screen? Hi, can you see it? We can see your screen. I'm trying to find your video to pin it to the recording. Just a minute. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. It should be good, good now. So please uh, proceed. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Nitsan Zamir, and I'm going to talk about probably approximately knowing a joint word with the Oral Moses. So probabilistic distributed systems arise frequently in computer science, and they are very useful in describing distributed biological systems such as ant colonies and the brain. Probabilistic systems arise when processes run probabilistic protocols in a probabilistic setting, and they typically provide probabilistic guarantees rather than deterministic guarantees. For example, mutual exclusion with high probability. So in mutual exclusion, the critical section must be empty when an agent enters it, and therefore the agent must know that the critical section is empty in order to enter it. In probabilistic mutual exclusion, the critical section is empty when the agent enters it, only with high probability. It is possible for a protocol for probabilistic mutual exclusion to satisfy the probabilistic requirement, although letting an agent enter the critical section despite knowing that it is not empty in some cases. So in this work, we want to explore what are the requirements from the agent's probabilistic belief when it enters the critical section in order to satisfy the probabilistic requirement. A probabilistic degree of belief in effect B is a value between zero and one that represents the probability that the agent assigns to phi being true. We use beta i phi to denote the probabilistic belief that i has regarding phi, and it is essentially the probability of phi conditioned on i's local state. We use beta i phi at alpha to denote the probabilistic degree of belief that i has regarding phi when it performs alpha. And finally, a probabilistic constraint is a statement of the form, the probability that a fact phi holds when i performs the action alpha is at least phi. In this way, we can have a probabilistic constraint that states that the probability that a critical section is empty when agent i enters it is at least 0.99. We treat p as the threshold of the probabilistic constraint. And if the protocol satisfies this constraint, we say that it meets the threshold. 
one thing we can show is that if i's degree of belief is at least p, at least the threshold, whenever i performs the action alpha, then the protocol is guaranteed to satisfy the probabilistic constraint. But this is not a necessary condition for satisfying the probabilistic constraint. Our main result, known as the expectation theorem, states that the probability that phi holds when i performs alpha equals the expected degree of belief that i has regarding phi when it performs alpha. So for the threshold to be met by the protocol, the threshold is being met by the protocol exactly if the expected degree of belief that i has regarding phi equal, uh, is at least the threshold. So um, in other words, that although the, the, the threshold doesn't have to be met, the, the degree of belief that i has regarding phi doesn't have to be at least p whenever i performs the action alpha, it must be at least p in expectation. A corollary from our expectation theorem is a property we call probably approximately knowing. It states that for a probabilistic constraint of a threshold of one minus epsilon squared to be met, I, the agent I must with high probability of at least one minus epsilon have a strong degree of belief of at least one minus epsilon when it performs alpha. And so uh, for a protocol to guarantee that a fact phi holds when I performs alpha with probability at least 0.9999, I must with high probability of at least 0.99 have a high degree of belief of at least 0.99 in phi when it performs alpha. To conclude, we captured the relationship between probabilistic beliefs and constraints in probabilistic systems. These connections can help us understand and improve probabilistic protocols. Thank you. Well, thanks for the talk. Um, let's see the questions here. Are there any questions? I'm just checking over the Zoom and Zulip. Okay, so I'm not sure I'm seeing all of the questions here. Uh, some people don't have access to Zulip. Okay, so thanks for the talk again. Could you comment on the applications of this probabilistic um, uh, properties on other systems, but those they are not those biological cases that you have mentioned? So um, it is a general um, um, rule that applies broadly in probabilistic systems. So whenever you have a probabilistic protocol, you can use our, um, our result as long as it satisfies the requirements. So uh, I saw that in previous talks, uh, people asked if we use uh, um, synchronous systems or asynchronous systems. So these uh, results apply to synchronous systems. Okay. Uh, do you have any extension to semi-synchrony or full asynchrony? Do you... Do um, you... So not, not at the moment, but uh, they're, they're, these are nice uh, extensions to our work. Okay. Thanks. Uh, if there are no more questions, we will keep on with the program. Uh, thanks, uh, Nitsan, for the great talk again. I will make the next presenter co-host. Gregor, you should be able to share your screen now. Right, yeah. One second. Okay, so can you see my slides and hear me and everything? Uh, I cannot see your slides yet. Okay. Uh, now I can see them. Okay. Now I can see them? Very well, thank you. Thanks, so this is a, this is a talk on positive aging admits fast synchronous plurality consensus by Gregor Benghammer in collaboration with Robert Edsessa, 
Dominic Kaza and Maciej Krunic. Uh, the talk is given by Gregor. Please proceed. Okay, yeah. so welcome everyone. So as the title of our work already suggests, we are considering the so-called plurality consensus problem. That is, we assume that we are given a network of n nodes and each of these nodes initially holds one of k different opinions. Or you could also imagine this as each node being colored in one of k different colors. And the goal is to derive a, a protocol that ensures that all n nodes decide on the same opinion, but not on any opinion, but rather the opinion that is initially the most frequent one. And as you can see here, we are also happy with uh, solutions that hold with high probability, so especially with randomized solutions. And one important notion in the context of plurality consensus is the so-called bias, which somehow describes how, how much of an advantage the plurality opinion has. So we define A and B to be basically the number of nodes that support the most and second most common opinion. And then we can define the bias by just the difference of A minus B. And we will also in uh, some running time bounds see this alpha value, which is basically the fraction A divided by B. And we, we call this the relative bias. But uh, the most important one here is, is the, the absolute bias A minus B. So um, when it comes to related work, so that the most related approaches operate in the synchronous gossip model and require an initial bias of roughly square root N log N. So the current state of the art is results are those two, which have been uh, interestingly enough uh, been developed uh, at roughly the same time. And uh, while this bounds may look complicated, if the bias is very small and also we have a high amount of different colors K, then this is something like log square of N, the running time. When it comes to asynchronous results, um, there is not that much uh, known yet. And this was also somehow the motivation of, of this work to, to come up with, with a result that is, that is comparable to the synchronous state of the art results. There is, for example, a population protocol, which, which, uh, which only supports two colors. And uh, there are, in fact, there are multiple population protocols, but they are also more, more concerned with reducing the number of states and also all assume that um, K K is a constant value. And, and then there's another result, which is probably the most close to our work, which is an O of log n time result in the Poisson clock model. However, even there, the range of K that is supported is limited and also the required bias is actually larger than in these other approaches. So um, I will now describe the asynchronous model that we consider. So it, uh, um, the nodes uh, can work as follows. So each node U is equipped with a clock. And whenever this clock ticks, then the node may establish communication channels to constantly many other nodes. And these other nodes may, like, for example, in the gossip model, be chosen uniformly at random. Or, and this is important, they may also be chosen out of a list of constantly many previously acquired node addresses. So this allows nodes, for example, to communicate with a leader node. And as soon as these uh, communication channels are established, then, we, then the information can be exchanged inst instantly and also the node can perform some local calculations instantly. Um, so we assume that uh, both the time between the, the ticks of the clock at U and also the time required to establish these communication channels follows the, uh, the so-called positive aging property. I will describe this in the next slide. And also these distributions should have constant mean. So here I give a definition of the positive aging property. So I don't have time to go into the details here. Just, just note that this is a generalization of the so-called memoryless property, which maybe some of you might know. And it's a property this, that the exponential distribution has. And intuitively, this just describes that the expected um, uh, waiting times um, are somehow maximized if the waiting time just started and not if the waiting time is already ongoing for some t time steps. So this is a very natural somehow, somehow property and therefore it's also fulfilled by many, many distributions which are used to model waiting times like exponential, Rayleigh, variable and so on. Another notion that we need to introduce is the so-called partial plurality consensus. Um, the motivation behind this is that uh, we cannot uh, solve uh, asynchronous plurality consensus in time less than log n. So this is in our model the case, but also in many other models, like in, for example, the population protocol model. 
and therefore we define partial plurality consensus and there we, we are basically we, we allow a one over polylog and fraction of nodes to not have reached consensus yet okay so these are now our results we basically we have three protocols and uh, they all require an initial bias of roughly square root n log n in favor of the plurality opinion and they support up to roughly square root n different colors the epsilon here is an arbitrary small constant and as we can see the partial consensus time somehow uh, matches uh, the the result of the synchronous uh, related results the second protocol even shaves off a log k factor and the final protocol is basically optimal with a log log n time uh, result. And if you want to not only achieve partial but full consensus, then we need O of log n further time steps. So, um, these improved results of the accelerated and the Poisson protocol, they come at the cost. And this is, um, we need to put some further restrictions on the model. So, I can only give you a short overview of this now. So, the Q then, so the accelerated protocol requires the distributions that we use to model waiting times to be Q dense. So in the full talk, I give a precise definition what this means. Just note that this is again fulfilled by many distributions, for example, exponential distribution. And uh, for the Poisson protocol, actually, as the name su suggests, we need to assume that the nodes are equipped with Poisson clocks. That means that the waiting times are modeled by exponential distributions and that communication is instant. And this means in this setting that the communication channels can be established instantly. Okay, so how do we fit in? How do we compare the related work? So basically, all our protocols are the, some of the first protocols which match the consensus time of the synchronous related approaches um, for a wide range of k and also a small, small initial bias, so roughly square root n log n. And of course, this is only possible in the setting where this uh, lower bound of asynchronous approaches is not violated. Additionally, we reach part, faster partial consensus than this related approach, uh, related asynchronous approach. And interestingly enough, so our second and third protocol, they are actually for many inputs faster uh, at the reaching partial and full consensus than any protocol that operates in a synchronous uh, round-based model with polylog and congestion. And with polylog and congestion, we mean here that in every round with high probability, each node contacts and also is contacted by at most polylog and many other nodes. All right, and that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I have a question. Um, have you considered any model where the, at least maybe not the full clock, but at least the distribution with which this clock ticks is controlled by a Byzantine adversary? Do you think it's possible to extend this analysis? So this is maybe different. So I, I'm, I'm sad I'm not uh, from a field that uh, discusses this Byzantine uh, failures a lot. So I'm not sure. And this was also not uh, in basically the main focus of this work. So I'm not sure. But it's what I can say is that it's one needs to be very careful um, how these distributions are chosen. So probably if you have some kind of adversary which which can do a lot of harm there, then this could could very well be problematic in this setting. Okay, so um, you basically it seems that you're basically in this uh, asynchronous model where the clock will tick randomly. Yeah. Um, do you do you think you do you need to know if you know the an upper bound for the delay? In, in these channels, let's say in a semi-synchronous model, can you improve the analysis somehow? Does it help if you know that the worst case, uh, if you know the worst case for uh, channel delay and for communication there? So probably not. So um, what this positive aging actually gives us is, is actually something, something like this. So this positive aging property allows us to give a bound Let's say you, you can you, you fix a node and you are currently at time t, then you can make a statement like in the next five time steps, this node will tick with probability, let's say 0 0.9 or something. And this is actually implied by this positive aging property. So I don't think we would gain, we would really gain much if we had a tighter bound on this or something like that. Okay, well, thanks for uh, the answers and the great talk.
We will now proceed to the next talk. I am making the presenter co-host now, so please share your screen. Uh, hi. hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, can you just me? waiting for the screen. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sharing my screen. Normally right now, okay, so. so the next talk is on case set agreement in round based models through combinatorial topology by Adam Shimi and Armando Castaneda. Uh, Adam will be given the talk. Yeah, so I start. Yeah, so thank, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so this talk is uh, a work quarter with Armando Castaneda, which is here, I think, in the, in the Zoom call. And it's about three things, which are case set agreement, round based model, and combinatorial topology. And so I'm going to try to explain what are the links between those three things. So first, um, one thing that is important, and that is kind of a starting point, is to say there are a lot of models of distributed computation. Even if you limit yourself to message passing models, there are uh, a lot of parameters to consider, and it's hard to compare these parameters. And so it's kind of sort of a mess. And one modern approach to deal with that is to use what we call rounds. And so the principle of rounds, I think you probably all know them, is to say you have processes that have a round number, broadcast some messages tagged with this round number, wait for the, the, the message with the same round number, and then compute the next state and message to send. And the thing here is we assume rounds, but not necessarily synchrony, because a lot of models with rounds have synchrony uh, locked in. And so you have some hypothesis, and if you do something where, where you take early message, you buffer them, and late message, so from rounds that are already passed, you just throw them away, you can implement rounds with nice property even in a synchronous system. And so this kind of de captures uh, many different modern models, such as the synchronous model with message adversaries, the herd of model, dynamic networks, and they all, all have in common the fact that kind of a model is a, you have a set of infinite sequences of graph. Uh, the graph for each round represents which process received a message from which other process at this round. And so instead of having all these incomparable, model, uh, imp incomparable parameters, sorry, uh, incomparable parameters, uh, what you have is uh, this formal sequence of graphs. And so what we want to do is use this and study problems on that. But one issue is there are not that much uh, general approach to do this. And so what we propose here is to take uh, a, a general technique in distributed computing, take a problem and show how they work together. And so our approach is a combinatorial topology approach to distributed computing, which basically uh, as, uh, considers at every point in the execution you take all the possible configuration of your distributed system and you glue them together in some way that makes them a highly dimensional geometric object. And then your execution is based on the transformations of this object, to simplify. And so we can actually prove uh, mathematical results on what this transformation imply and what, are, what is allowed to solve certain problems and these kind of things. And this is... Um, yeah, and so we apply that because it's a very uh, powerful technique that is uh, implied by default the existence of layers, which are pretty much rounds. So it makes sense to use them there. And the problem we're using is case set agreement. So for those of you who, doesn't, who don't know, case set agreement is the generalization of consensus where instead of saying, I want, we want everyone to decide on the same value, you can decide to uh, up to K different values. And so it kind of gives you a number that captures the, the agreement abilities of the model instead of just something like, um, something like a binary choice. And also case agreement, there are nice property uh, in the combinatorial topology approach, which basically says that if your complex, so this combinatorial object is K connected, so Cannot, doesn't have holes of a certain dimension relative to K, then you cannot solve K-set agreement on the corresponding uh, model of distributed computing. 
And so what we do is we use combinatorial topology to prove K-set agreement results uh, on uh, this uh, round-based models. And so just uh, something that is important on the models we consider is we consider round-based models that are oblivious. So I say you have these sequence of communication graphs and here what we say is instead of taking any possible sequence of communication graph, we limit ourselves to the set of sequences that are defined by at each round, we can choose one of these possible graphs, but we don't constrain what one graph, uh, what, what, what are the sequence of graph itself. So you want to say at each round, you need to have graphs of this shape, of, uh, in this set. And the other property here is uh, we have a model that we call closed above. And so what it means is um, this set of graph has a specific property and this property is that this um, it is defined by a, a couple uh, a subset of graphs and every graph in the super set contains one of these uh, subgraph so you have this subgraph that define this this uh, this uh, set of graphs of possible graphs and what this gives you in terms of terminal topology is that the complex that correspond to this model is what we call a pseudosphere, which is uh, really nice, and we can actually do a lot of things, topologically speaking, with it. And so the rest of the, the other point I want to talk before closing this presentation is what we prove are lower bounds and upper bounds on the K for which K-state agreement is solvable for a given model. And the thing that is interesting about these bounds is that despite the fact that we use combinatorial topology to prove them, we don't, they are not stated in terms of combinatorial topology. Instead, they're stated in terms of what we call combinatorial numbers, which are just properties of the sets of graph defining the model. And so there's different kind of numbers and you can look either to the full presentation or the paper to have more details about that. And so, uh, for example, we have this kind of, uh, this kind of bounds, so you, the, I, I, don't, I don't explain the, the numbers presented here, but they don't depend on topological, on combinatorial topological ideas at all. I mean, the definition of the numbers at least. And we have lower bounds and upper bounds, and we have some way to go from um, lower bounds and upper bounds for one round to lower bounds and upper bounds for multiple rounds uh, for specific algorithm that only remember uh, the initial value of process they know of and not, not the full information that they receive. And so that's, uh, in summary, what we, we gave. And I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Adam, for the great talk. We have a couple of questions here. Oh. Uh, on Zulik, we have Andrea asking, how do processes know the asynchronous routes they're in, since the notion of time in asynchronous environments is not enough? And some processes may be activated many times in one asynchronous route. Or maybe you just look at the resulting configuration after an asynchronous round in an abstract way. That is, processes do not need to know this. Um, I would say that, okay, so I think the, the, the idea of asynchronous round that, that is uh, thought about here is pretty much you have, um, so you have all this asynchronous wake up, but there's only one point in the round, which is at the end of the round, at the last wake up of the round, for which uh, you have actually a computation. So every other wake up is, okay, is it time to go to the end of the round? So have I received enough messages or this kind of thing? Sort of like in a failure detector uh, algorithm where you say, okay, did I receive every message from non-suspected process, for example? And then only at the end, you actually do the computation. And that's, uh, so that's why you have only one computation step per round in this context. Cool. Okay, so we have further questions um, from Faith Allen. Uh, is the synchronous message passing model with at most F crash failures an oblivious round based model? Uh, uh, so we, yes, because, yes, bec um, uh, I mean, Okay, no, it isn't because the, so I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the Herdoff model, which is the round based model on the, on the best of, but like the synchronous, you, so you encode um, 
the synchronous crashes by saying that if at, and at one round someone uh, didn't receive a message from this process, then forever nobody will ever receive a message from this process in the following round. You cannot hide crashes in a synchronous uh, model, in a synchronous version of rounds. Whereas in a, in a synchronous model, you don't really, uh, you, you, you just wait for n minus f messages and so you don't have this property. So the asynchronous version is oblivious, but the synchronous one is not. Okay. Uh, she has a follow-up question. Yeah. Are your lower bounds for all algorithms or just a restricted class of algorithms? So, um, so I, I, I passed on this in this explanation. So the one realm lower bounds are for every kind of algorithm, but the multiple rounds lower bounds are for um, what we call oblivious algorithm which means that these are algorithms that at each round kind of throw away every information that they have except the pairs of process and initial value that they know of. So they don't remember what is the path of messages that gave them uh, this information, but they do remember uh, which initial value they know and for which process it is the initial value of. And we have a question by Karen. Uh, could this be used for bounding additional problems, say delivering the input of a single process to all? Um, so, okay, I'm, I'm less, I, I think intuitively I would say yes, um, because, uh, but the thing is, how do you, what are the topological properties of this? And so I'm not, I'm not sure of that. One reason we use case set agreement is also because there's a clear topological uh, property that we're looking for and so that we're trying to prove in these bounds. Uh, but yeah, probably, uh, maybe Amanda could, could answer this question in Zulip uh, better than me. Okay, uh, and one more uh, last question by Ami. Uh, what is the reason to consider only closed above models? Okay, so there's two answers to this question. The first one is because we actually can prove results on them. So the nice thing is, so when we're working on this, we kind of, we are looking for some models for which the complex uh, that are generated by these models are usable. And the fact that closed above model gives pseudospheres means that we can actually uh, compute the connectivity of these models. Uh, you know, it, which it's way easier to do that than for random uh, models. But there also, it's also like a class that has some meaning because what it says is you have this property that is, that is necessarily uh, here. So it's kind of a safety uh, model where you say, okay, there must necessarily be a cycle or a star or uh, every process needs that to receive at least N minus F messages. And so we have this kind of safety property that must always hold. So there's a natural definition, but it's also because it helps us prove properties. So yeah. Um, I will proceed to the next talk. There's some more questions. Uh, I would like people to post them on Zulip and if you're yeah. not able to, I will uh, do that. Uh, but let's proceed to the next talk, um, which is a brief announcement. And I'll be making the presenter co-host just a minute. So please share your screen. Great. Uh, the Next presentation is a brief announcement on using no messages in a Byzantine setting by Guy Gorain and Johan Moses. And Guy will be presenting. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, yeah, great. So my name is Guy and I'm presenting a joint work with my advisor, Johan Moses on using null messages in a Byzantine setting. And we took as a case study, the classic consensus problem, which means Byzantine failures, synchronous network. We know that dealing with Byzantine failures can cause uh, communication to be very expensive. So we are interested in solutions that are efficient in both time and communication. 
and especially in those that are highly efficient in fatal free executions. We achieve this by making extensive use of null messages. I'll illustrate by an example how this could be used for consensus. So we have a predefined committee that collects proposals and sends recommendations to everyone. Then a process that received a unanimous recommendation from the committee remains silent in the following round. In particular, if every process received a unanimous recommendation, then this round is completely silent. After which, a process that received no messages during this round is guaranteed that every correct process previously received a unanimous recommendation. Therefore, it can now safely decide. Well, the full details are in the paper, of course. But this last round is an example of what we call a silent validation round. Silent validation round is a fundamental primitive that allows us to broadcast global information at the cost of a single round and no messages whatsoever in failure-free executions, of course. This useful primitive is a key factor in the efficiency of our layers. And in our work, we present a modular way to transform any Byzantine consensus protocol into one that is extremely efficient in failure-free executions. The way we do it is by designing very short layers that consist of only three or four rounds, like the one I've showed you in the previous slide. And when no failures occur, then decision is reached within this layer. If failures do happen to occur, control is transferred to a Byzantine consensus protocol of choice. The result is solutions that are highly efficient in failure-free executions. And in executions with failures, they add only a negligible or insignificant cost to the consensus protocol chosen. The solution is also modular and will fit any consensus protocol you choose. Now, on a broader sense, uh, beside improving the communication complexity, or as Yoram calls it, counting bits, we are trying to capture a principle here in an explicit way. That's in asynchronous systems, communication flows only via message chains. Synchronous systems, however, allow communication to flow in many possible patterns, sometimes quite complicated. We've demonstrated how this could be used to reduce communication in the more challenging Byzantine setting. And this is another example of how time and silence can play a key role in distributed computing. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'm here. Thanks for the presentation. So if I understood this right, uh, your transformation works also, works basically for synchronous communication models. Yes, we're talking about, uh, synchro about synchronous settings when the network is synchronous and reliable and only the processes are Byzantine faulty, completely no signatures. Well, okay. If you, yeah. Yep, well, thanks. Um, if right. anyone has more questions, we have Zulip, a, to a topic on Zulip for that. I don't think there are any right now. Uh, so let's thank all the speakers again for this great session. And I'd like to remind everyone that the next session starts in 45 minutes. So don't go away if you don't see a session starting right now. Uh, next session will be on coordination. It will start at 4.45 p.m. Central European time. Uh, so please stay tuned in 45 minutes from now. Thanks again.